Welcome to the EKG Guy, and welcome if this is your first time. Here we are back at EKG of the Week, and we have a 72-year-old female with acute pericarditis, hypotension, and distant heart sounds. Here is her EKG, and what you want to do is take a moment to pause the video, go through it yourself, try to come up with your own interpretation, and we'll go through it uh, once you're ready. All right, so hopefully you had a chance to go through this and try to make your own interpretation. Uh, if not, uh, that's fine. We'll go through it together right now. So first thing we want to look at, and this is the approach we've been using here, is looking at the regularity, okay? The regularity of the rhythm. Is it regular or irregular, okay? If it's regular, we can stop there. If it's irregular, is it irregularly irregular? Uh, or is it... Uh, regularly irregular okay so that's where we'll go through so in this portion what we can look here is probably the best one are these leads down here in v5 okay it has the it's a rhythm strip so we want to use one of these three rhythm strips okay to look at the regularity going across you could use these here going this way but i would use one of the rhythm strips and look at the r to r intervals those tend to stand out the most here here's one r wave and here's the next this is the r to r interval and you want to look at if these are consistent between each one okay so notice that the duration okay which is along our x-axis is different amongst each one of these okay so in other words, this is not only an irregular rhythm, this is an irregularly irregular rhythm, okay? Meaning that there's no regularity to this rhythm whatsoever. So we would call this irregularly irregularly. Well, uh, so we'll just call it IRIR for now, okay? So irregularly irregular, that's the rhythm. Next, because of it's not a regular rhythm, there's one way that we can use that's easy to find the rate other than looking obviously at what the machine gives you, but our goal is to be able to interpret this on our, by ourselves and without the help of the machine. So what we wanna do is, first of all, know that from beginning to the end is 10 seconds and 10 seconds times six is 60 seconds, meaning that if we find the number of complexes, multiply that by six, we can get the rate in beats per minute. Okay, so let's try that here. Again, let's use these complexes down at the bottom. I'll erase this to kind of clear it up. All right, and now let's count them. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and this is 16. So what you wanna do is 16 times six, and 16 times six is 96 beats per minute, okay? And the actual rate from the machine was 94 beats per minute. So we got 96 beats per minute, and the actual machine gave 94 beats per minute. So you can see where quite close here, okay? Uh, so not a fast rate below 100 beats per minute, but that's a good uh, estimate of the rate there. So hopefully that makes sense. Next, we wanna look at the rhythm origin, okay? And the rhythm origin, that means, is it coming from an atrial source? somewhere maybe from the sinus node? Is it coming from a junctional source or in the AV node or maybe the His bundle or a ventricular source, okay? We have narrow complexes, which suggest that we have a supraventricular rhythm, okay? Meaning it's coming from above the ventricles. In addition, we have complexes that are not preceded by P waves, okay? You may think here in V1 that maybe these are P waves, okay? But you must remember that those above and below are the same thing, meaning that there is a temporal relationship on the EKG. So if you look up and down here, these are all complexes that represent ventricular depolarization. And if you were to put these together, you would see that all those that kind of maybe look like P waves in V1 are in fact QRS complexes, okay? So you can see that they're all up and down if you went drew this all the way through, you would see that that's the case. So there are actually no P waves, so no P waves preceding any of these. So all this area between, no P waves preceding any portion of that. So no P waves present, okay? An irregularly irregular rhythm, okay? All right, and we don't have um, 
any wide complexes. So we said it is supraventricular. So the source is likely supraventricular. So we can write that above the ventricle. So supraventricular source, um, likely not a, a sinus rhythm, obviously, because we have a irregular rhythm. Okay, no evidence of sinus arrhythmia here. No P waves that we can clearly make out. Okay, so supraventricular rhythm without any P waves. Okay, we don't think this is coming from the sinus node. It may be coming from uh, the AV node or somewhere in the atria. Okay, and this should already give you a clue that we have an irregularly irregular rhythm at a rate of 96 beats per minute, a superventricular source. This is most likely coming from the atria. Okay, so that should give you a clue to what this underlying rhythm is. Okay. Next, we have to look at the ventricular axis. In these, we tend to use the um, R axis, which is the ventricular axis here. You'll see on the machine or the paper it gives you. All right, in the R axis, we use the limb leads. So we use these leads here to find the ventricular axis in the frontal plane. So we're using the frontal plane. That's the one that it typically gives you, okay? So in this case, we have to know our quadrant system, okay? And our quadrant system, if we were to draw it here, remember that normal ventricular axis is from negative 30 degrees to about positive 110 degrees. So all this here is normal. All this up here would be a left axis shift. So beyond that negative 30 degrees, this would be right axis deviation, okay? And this is that northwest axis or no man's land, you may have heard of it, or a north, so north because this is north and this is west, so that's where you get that northwest axis, okay? Um, or superior rightward axis, you may hear it as, okay? So all different names for it. So normal axis, we said, is in this region here, okay? So let's determine the axis. Now, before doing so, we have to know where some of these leads are placed. So similarly, if we put our leads, the ones I want you to focus on are leads one, which are here, it's this one here, and then AVF. So AVF sits at positive 90 degrees, and lead one is at zero degrees. Both of these are the positive ends. Here's AVF, okay? So now if we draw out our quadrant system, okay, we said we have lead one here at zero degrees. This is AVF. If we look at lead one, okay, you can see that this is mostly positive, all right? Meaning that if you were to draw a baseline, you would see that it's mostly above the baseline, okay? Mostly positive complexes, meaning that we'll go towards the positive end of lead one, okay? So this is the positive end. Next, we look at AVF down here, and you can see these complexes are mostly above the baseline, meaning, again, it's a positive one, and we're going towards the positive end of this lead, okay? Now, just to help confirm that, we have lead two that sits here at positive 60 degrees. If you look at lead two, again, that's mostly positive, meaning that our axis lies somewhere within this region between zero degrees and positive 90 degrees, okay? You see two is mostly positive, AVL, mostly negative. So between there, and the actual axis here was um, positive 70 degrees, okay? And positive 70 degrees would end up coming about right there, okay? So within normal limits. Remember, here's our normal axis. So we have a normal ventricular axis. So let's just write this here, a normal axis at positive 70 degrees. Next, we look at atrial conduction. And here we tend to look at at the P waves, okay? And we're asking ourselves, is there any atrial enlargement, any right or left atrial abnormality that we should uh, mention or look for, okay? And in this case, we said there are no P waves, so in fact, we don't have any abnormal atrial conduction per se. In looking at AV nodal conduction, again, this is where we want to look at that PR interval. Are there any dropped beats, okay? Well, certainly we don't have any P waves. And you have to remember that those normal complexes, if we were to draw one out, this being the P wave, this is our QRS complex, or in this case, an RS complex, because here's an R wave and this is an S wave, okay? And this is our T wave. And remember, we're looking at the P waves, okay? As you can see, I start here. Now we're looking at AV conduction, and that would be from here up until here. But if we don't have a P wave present, we don't really have much AV conduction, okay? Or at least it's starting from that area, okay? In this case, you do have AV conduction, and we'll, we'll look at that in a second. But And then IV conduction, or intraventricular 
focusing on this area here. Are there any issues with ventricular conduction? In this case, the QRS complex was narrow at 80 milliseconds, so there are no um, abnormalities with IV conduction, intraventricular conduction. Okay, so the QRS interval here was in fact 80 milliseconds. And remember in adults, normal is between 70 and 110 milliseconds. Okay, two to three small boxes about. Once you hit 120 and beyond, that's we consider that a prolonged or intraventricular conduction delay. Okay, next we want to look at waveforms. Again, we don't have any P waves, so there's no, there's no P waves, there's no PR segment, which would be this area here, no PR interval. Uh, so we can't look at depression or elevation of that. The QRS complexes, okay, we have normal morphology there. We don't see any issues with the ST segment, right? No significant elevation or depression, okay? Uh, and no, you know, big issues with the T waves. Maybe some non specific changes uh, in the T waves, okay? What we mean about that, you can see some here. All right, um, but really that is not anything that we get too uh, alarmed about, okay? And you'll see that because it's always ideal to compare to a previous ECG, and that was seen there. So unless they're new and they're dynamic T wave changes, then I wouldn't get too excited about them. So um, no significant uh, waveforms, the QT interval uh, here, the QTC, I'll just give you that number, uh, was 398 milliseconds okay remember we have a female patient this is within normal limits um, and we're okay there okay and we always want to look at that because that can sometimes uh, determine the antiemetics so some of the nausea medications some of the antibiotics we use with our patients so good thing to know for um, clinical purposes okay um, so is there anything else that we're missing here Okay, well, there is one thing, and I want to bring it to your attention, and that's the low voltage. You probably noticed that, okay, it's the low QRS voltage, okay, that you should be aware of. And I want you to just uh, really take that away. So let's just look at what do we mean by low QRS voltage. Well, this actually depends on the limb leads, which are these ones here, okay, so these are the limb leads. And then the precordial leads have their own criteria, okay? And what do we mean by that? Well, we're looking at the QRS complexes, which are these ones here. And all of these in the limb leads, if they're less than five millimeters in amplitude, above and below the baseline, which you can clearly see that. Remember that five amplitudes would be, or millimeters would be this small blocks in uh, amplitude and voltage. And you can see that's the case here. So that's true. And then less than 10 millimeters in the precordial leads, okay? And even though this one looks like it's tall, it is not meeting that 10 millimeters, okay? So maybe nine at most but not there and you can see that throughout okay obviously not in v1 not in v2 not in v4 v5 and v6 it's higher for those in the precordial leads because remember those leads sit right on top of the chest are quite close to that atrial or that the heart's activity so that's the criteria i want you to remember less than five millimeters in the limb leads less than 10 millimeters in the precordial leads so that makes the uh it meets the criteria for low qrs voltage okay and then r wave progression that's the R wave amplitude, okay, as we go across. Now we're looking at the precordial lead, so these here. So as we go from V1, okay, all the way to V6, we should see an increase in these R waves, okay? So barely make them out here, and here's an R wave. Notice how it's getting greater in amplitude up until V5, that's what we wanted to see. So V1 to V5, it's normal here, normal R wave progression. So you can either see an increase in the R wave amplitude, from V1 to V5, which is considered normal, or you can have an increase in the R wave to S wave ratio from V1 to V5, okay? That'd be normal. So notice that the S waves are getting smaller as we go, okay? And that makes sense as we go more leftward, we have more of those forces that are uh, giving you that bigger R wave, okay? So normal R wave progression. When we talk about transitional zone, that's again here in our precordial leads. And that's when we're going from a mostly uh, negative complex or negative QRS complex. Okay, as you can see here, here's our baseline. 
maybe still slightly more negative, but clearly more positive here in V3, okay? Normal transition is between V3 and V4. So this one is occurring between V2 and V3, so slightly in early transition, okay? And early transition uh, would be a counterclockwise rotation, okay? And how do I remember that? Well, if you imagine a clock here from V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6, okay? Normal R wave is between here, or normal transitional zone, okay? If it's gonna go counterclockwise, that would be this way, occurring earlier. So counterclockwise going backwards, and this is a clockwise going forward, okay, if it occurs after there. We said hours occurred early between this area, between V2 and V3, so it's an early transition or a counterclockwise, both meaning the same. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense and that's just small details. Now you have to remember that these last two things I keep at the end because this really uh, depends on lead placement and is highly dependent on that. Remember that lead placement is still uh, an imperfect science so it's uh, hard to put so much faith in it but it can certainly be helpful in some cases, okay? All right, so that's that. And next uh, we want to now, you can take what we've gathered here Okay, and try to come up with a final interpretation. So we have an irregularly irregular rhythm, a rate of 96 beats per minute, likely an atrial source, okay? And that should give you an idea that this is atrial fibrillation, okay? So atrial fibrillation, irregularly irregular rhythm, normal rate, so it's not, uh, this is a controlled ventricular response within 60 to 100 beats per minute, okay? Uh, not a fast rate. Remember, if it's over 100, we call it rapid uh, ventricular response, or RVR. So we have atrial fibrillation as our underlying rhythm. Normal axis. Didn't say much about atrial or AV conduction, per se. Okay. Um, and then we have intraventricular conduction is normal here. In our waveforms, we didn't say there's many abnormalities, but we did mention the low QRS voltage here. Okay. And in this case, that is uh, something to be aware of. There's many causes. Maybe someone has a bad heart, okay? It's not causing much of an impulse. Maybe it's their BMI. They have a high, quite obese, so they're a lot of fat pad. It could be the breast tissue that's getting in the way. Um, but other things that we should be aware of, especially in this setting of a patient with acute pericarditis presenting with hypotension and distant heart sounds, we want to worry about um, an effusion, okay? You have an inflamed pericardium that you can develop fluid around the heart, and just that alone can make the distance of the electrical activity that the electrodes pick up uh, look like they're much farther away, okay? Uh, so that's an important thing um, to note, all right? And that's actually what was going on here. This patient had a pericardial effusion, may have been developing tamponade, in fact, okay? So tamponade uh, with the distant heart sounds. Distant heart sounds probably because there's a lot of fluid between that region, okay? Hypotension. If there was JVD or jugular venous distension, we may be worried about uh, tamponade in that area, okay? So that's one thing to note. And then we did say the nonspecific uh, T-wave abnormalities. So we can put that here. So nonspecific T-wave abnormalities, okay? Now, when compared to the previous EKG, there is a change in the QRS voltage, okay? So now the voltage is low, okay? And the patient was actually still in atrial fibrillation. So uh, that the rhythm's not new, but the voltage change is new. And it's something that uh, can clue you in that there may be a pericardial effusion. In fact, that is what was going on here. Okay, so uh, atrial fibrillation, low QRS voltage in the limb and precordial leads. And, okay, we mentioned that this patient ended up having a pericardial effusion. Okay, so things to note, okay, and acute pericarditis is certainly something that can cause it. All right, well, that's the end of this lecture and this week's EKG of the Week. I hope you learned something. Now, I want to make you aware of our um, EKG coding reference that many of you are already using, uh, how to get access, okay? Uh, so you want to go to this link here. So put in that link into um, your uh, into the computer, into your internet source, and then go to put your email address here when you get to that. And then you're going to use my password here to put in there. Make sure you're using my password every time, okay? 
and let me just erase so you're not, so let's do this one here all lowercase put that in and then click submit confirm your email so check your email get a confirmation and you'll have access okay and access here will be this and you'll start to see that we have examples and I'm now adding videos into it so this is an on-the-go reference has everything you could possibly imagine uh, we use as we're building the course for our fellows here at Mail Clinic um, and so forth so I think it's quite handy our techs are using it we're using it for coding uh, here as well so very helpful way to learn to use as a reference and so forth okay and you'll see a lot of the things we discussed in this lecture uh, there as well all right, so a few things. If you thought, thought this was helpful, if you did, yes or no, I would like to know how I can improve, what kind of topics you want. Please leave them below. Like this video if you find this helpful uh, and share with friends. If you want more practice, okay, obviously more practice, practice is on our Facebook page where there's almost half a million of you there uh, and thank you for your support we have daily questions trying to get back to you uh, between our clinics and making sure we're staying in touch so uh, go there for practice there's daily practice I leave resources you can find us on Twitter search the EKG guy YouTube obviously in uh, Facebook okay it's hard to keep up with all these things so uh, find us there share with your friends if you find this helpful um, and please leave a comment if there's any topic um, or just kind words we always appreciate it and I hope you learned something today well thank you for making us the largest fastest growing EKG community in the world